Hello, students. Um, I'm Brad Lynn. I'm the instructor for the Big Picture of Scripture class, and we're going to be doing some of our lectures online. So thanks for taking time to view this lecture. This is lecture one, the first lecture. It's going to be a course introduction, and we're also going to try to touch a little bit on what is the Bible. Um, it's, it's really not going to be a full lecture on what is the Bible, but just a, an introduction to that concept as well. And so Thanks again for joining me. I'm going to share my screen. It usually takes me a second to share my screen each time. It's a little awkward, a little clumsy, but if I don't do it in a certain order, I'm not able to, to view the screen in the right way. So bear with me each time on these uh, on these lectures, if you would. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. So... Um, know that I'm praying for you this semester, and uh, I'm really excited. I'm hoping that this is going to be a, a lot of fun, this class. Uh, so I'll jump into it. The The goal of this uh, course is really to help you better understand the Bible in a, in a uh, big point of view. But uh, this lecture is going to, as I mentioned, touch on the introduction. So... The text that we're working off is Christ from Beginning to End, which is a book by Tr uh, Trent Hunter and Stephen Wellam. Here's a copy of the book. I don't have the, the cover on it, but the uh, Steve Wellam was actually a professor, is a professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's a professor that I've been lucky enough to have in class. Um, we've already kind of went through the syllabus and the course objectives, so I'm going to just discuss some additional introductory matters here. Uh, it's this is not a textbook. It's not meant to guide us through this course, but I'm kind of trying to use it that way to some extent. Um, I'm really using it to supplement our reading. I hope our primary reading is really going to be in the Bible, and we're going to have some discussions and activities based on that. Uh, but this this is a book that probably is meant to be written read in a in a week or in a couple week period of time or less. But we're going to take our time and just go through it a little bit at a time. In the foreword of the book, Mark Deaver states that the authors wrote the book to help readers better understand Jesus by helping them better understand the Bible. And, and that's our hope for this course. The Bible is very complex and learning how it fits together can be challenging. Hopefully, maybe some of you really have a good grasp of the Bible. And if so, I hope this course will, will help you a little bit uh, to better understand it even more. And for some of us who maybe are still working on trying to put the pieces together, I hope that this course will, will aid you in that effort. It's a lifelong effort, and uh, I certainly don't presume that this course will, will teach you everything you need to know about the Bible, but hopefully it'll give you some uh, a leg up from where you stand today. The authors encourage the reader to view the complexity of the Bible not as so much as a discouragement or a challenge that's going to be very difficult to overcome, but more like you would... Uh, an exciting opportunity. They use the idea of um, readers um, not seeing the Bible as a hurdle or the complexity of the Bible as a hurdle, but to see it as a scenic forest trail. Uh, the more complex it is, the more beautiful it is, the more there is to learn and grow. And so uh, hopefully, um, rather than only seeing the complexity or the difficulty of the Bible as a challenge, hopefully you'll, you'll see it also as, as an opportunity and as a, a beautiful uh, journey. One of the quotes that the authors put in their book was, what if the Bible's many characters, events, and places are not in the way of getting to know Jesus, but they are the way to get to know Jesus? What if the, the numerous pages of the Bible aren't a reason for intimidation, but they're a call for exploration? And that's kind of the challenge that I hope for us to, to have here, to, to start to view it that way. I've read the Bible for much of my life. And I'm thankful for that. I've learned there was discipline uh, that was valuable in, in reading the Bible. But honestly, only in the last several years have I really started to see it being unlocked in my life, really to be able, being able to put all the pieces together and really understand it. And my goal is for you students is to be able to maybe just give you a little edge further along in that journey, maybe share with you a few things that I wish I would have understood sooner. And so that, you know, that you don't have to wait as long to be able to learn certain things that maybe some of it you can learn now and you'll get more and more fruit out of reading the Bible as, as part of that. Certainly, we know that we need the Holy Spirit to unlock the Bible for us. And that's the primary way we're going to learn the Bible is through God opening our eyes to see it. And I'll be praying for that this semester as well. One of the things that I liked in Hunter and Willem's introduction was they shared three convictions um, they believe that the Bible is a book about Jesus, and I agree. 
uh, they believe that the Bible is a unified story. Yes, it is. Uh, 66 unique books. There's many different authors written over a long period of time. But what they believe and what I believe is that God supervised that. God uh, ordained those authors. And he had a big picture in mind that he was progressively unfolding a, a unified story. And so that's the way they see the Bible. And I agree. Uh, through the Bible story, we come to know Jesus in all his glory. Uh, what, what these authors are arguing is that the, the story of the Bible reaches its climax in the life and work and ministry of Jesus. And uh, that's what we're looking to see here. And I think that we're going to see that, that the Old Testament and the New Testament both point to the culmination of work in Jesus. Um, can the Bible be read inaccurately? Is there a right way to read the Bible? I think that's a good question to think about. Um, maybe in some ways it, it can't be, but I think generally it, it can be read inaccurately. The authors use the analogy uh, of a mosaic versus a puzzle. You know, if it was a mosaic, if it was a, a smorgasbord of, of different images or ideas that, that kind of fit together in no perfect order, then maybe, uh, maybe you could argue that the Bible couldn't be read inaccurately. But with a puzzle, you, you know each piece has a very specific place and they have to fit together well for you to interpret the, the, the picture that's being displayed. And I think the Bible is more that way. I think the Bible is meant to be interpreted in the context. Of, uh, there's multiple contexts of the Bible, and we'll get to that, but that the, the Bible is meant to be interpreted within context. And if we don't understand the context, it's very difficult to understand the individual passages. We have to understand the passage to understand the broader storyline. And we have to understand the broader storyline to understand the passage. Uh, and and uh, the Bible does tell a unified story. Uh, the, the authors claim this in their book. And I'm going to attempt to demonstrate that in this course. Uh, and perhaps it's important to understand how this story fits together. Let's look at a narrative of the Gospel of Luke that will help us better understand uh, this argument or this point. Um, if we look at Luke 24, uh, if you wanted to open your Bibles to that, I think that would be helpful. In just a minute, I'm going to read into it. But in this class, we'll, we'll talk a lot about context. In later chapters, we'll be reading and discussing three contexts or horizons of Scripture and these authors uh, in this book refer to those contexts as the close context, the continuing context, and the complete context. If you took my class before, a different class of mine, you might have heard me refer to these three contexts, and maybe I call them other terms such as the immediate context or the close context, the covenantal context, and the canonical context. Regardless of what terms we use to describe them, I think it's it's a good argument that there's really three uh, horizons of scripture or three contexts which we want to think about and consider as we read each passage in the Bible. But let's take a look for now. Let's start by taking a look at the closer, the immediate context. So in Luke 24, before we even read it, we could start to think about the context. And I'm not going to try to overanalyze this passage, but I do want to, whoops, I do want to uh, I do want to um, take a quick look at it. And so, I, as I said, the, the close context would be to suggest, like, when we're reading the Gospel of Luke, where is this passage located and what's going on before we jump into it? So you could look at uh, Luke 23 before we read Luke 24 and even just look at some of the headings. It says, Jesus before Pilate, Jesus before Herod, Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, Jesus is buried, the resurrection. So what the context of this is, this is at the end of Jesus's earthly ministry. He's been tried. Uh, he's been found guilty, uh, crucified, died, was buried. He rose again. And that's what leads us into the passage that we're going to start to read today. Um, <clears throat> we see in chapter 24 that Jesus rose from the dead and two angels appeared to some of his disciples at the empty tomb. Here we pick up with two of his disciples walking from Jerusalem to the nearby town of Emmaus. And so we'll take a look at the passage. If we move from to Luke 24 and we jump to verse 11, I'll start there. But these words seemed to them, <clears throat> to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So Jesus is getting on the road to Emmaus, and, and there's some disciples that are walking. Um, 
Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. I'm sorry. Peter ran to the, this is before, at the, right after the resurrection. Peter ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now on the road to Emmaus, that very day, the same day of the resurrection, two of them, the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cle Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know that these things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides at all this point, it is still now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe, and all the prophets have spoken. Would it, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures all the things concerning himself. So, as we look at that passage... It's obvious we see this in the Gospel of Luke in Luke 24, but you know, in, in gospel directly translated means good news. But obviously, here these two disciples have yet to, to realize that Jesus' death is ultimately good news. They're sad, they're disappointed. They think that their their hopes in the Messiah have been dashed at the grave. So the that's the immediate context of the story. But what, what would you say would be the main point of the passage? To me, I think the main point of the passage is clearly that Jesus is the Messiah that they were waiting for, and that they need to interpret Scripture better to, to see that more clearly. And certainly they, that Jesus' revelation of himself helps us to reinterpret the Old Testament. And reinterpret, I don't mean to throw away the previous interpretations. It means to see the better and the deeper interpretation, to better see the entire unified storyline. It's almost like watching a movie when you get to the end and you start over and you watch it again, you might notice things differently. In this case, Jesus is encouraging us to look at the scriptures and, and see that they pointed to Jesus. <clears throat> And I think that's the point of the passage. The point of the passage is, number one, I am that Messiah, according to Jesus. I am that Messiah who was promised. I am that same Jesus who was crucified. I've risen. And, and the next point of the passage is, is, for you to better interpret the Old Testament, you need to interpret it in light of my resurrection. Um, another question you could ask yourself is, how does the passage connect to the broader storyline of Scripture? So, I'm kind of trying to do that right here, but a, a question you might ask yourself is, what might Jesus have showed them as he was going through and reinterpreting scripture? What passages might he have showed them? I think he could have showed them almost any passage in the Bible, but what specifically would have maybe been one that he would have chosen? And I don't I don't know the answer to that question, but let's just speculate. Let's just try one um, and start with maybe Isaiah 53. So Isaiah 53 was written probably about 700 to 740 years before Jesus was even born. And let's just see what it says. Let's read part of it. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And who, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And like sheep who have gone astray, we have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that bear its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. And as for this generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken by the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And we could go on. There's a lot more here. Um, but I think what Jesus is saying is, look, guys, like, if you had understood the Old Testament scriptures, you would know that I would have had to die. You would know that I, the Messiah, am also the, the same, the one and the same as the described suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Over 700 years ago, it was prophesied that one would come to pay the penalty for your sins. And that person would be stricken from this world. He would be put in the grave. And so how could how could I be your Messiah if I wasn't put in the grave? And he's helping them to reinterpret scripture in light of his resurrection. And I think that's important for us to think about how this fits together. Um, another example is Psalm 22. We find that here. In Psalm 22, we can see uh, this is from, from David, probably written a thousand to eleven hundred years before Jesus was born. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. You've given him his heart's oh no, I'm sorry, that was Psalm 21. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day. But you do not answer. Even there we can see, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are some of the last words of Jesus on the cross as recorded in the Gospels. So we can see that, that Christ was quoting David. And maybe in another way of looking at it is that David was prophesying, maybe even unknowingly, about Christ. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day. But you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And our fathers trusted. They trusted and delivered them. If I move forward a little bit. All who see me mock me, in verse 7. They make mouths. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. If you remember that Jesus was mocked on the cross. You know, call on a legion of angels. Um, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You may trust me at your mother's breast. Oh, you, on you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Many strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open their mouths, and like a ravening and roaring lion, I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted with my breast. My strength is dried up like potsherd. And my tongue sticks to my jaws, and you lay, uh, you lay in the dust of the earth. For dogs encompass me; they have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my mar garments. They divide my garments among them. For for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. So we can see here. We see that David was probably almost certainly unknowingly prophesying. He was writing a psalm. He was writing a lament to the Lord. He was certainly writing about himself. But what we can kind of see in the bigger storyline of Scripture, when we can take a step back and then look closer at Psalm 22 and at Luke 24, we can see that this, this is also a prophecy. This is, this is a twofold meaning. One was the meaning that David had in his immediate context, and the, the greater is the meaning that God had when he chose David to write this and he inspired David to write this and that he was also forecasting and predicting and prophesying about what was to come. In fact, David is a type of Jesus and we'll get into pol topology later, but David was forecasting what would happen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David is on one hand prophesying about Jesus and at the other hand, Jesus is quoting David. But certainly, um, the fact that he says that his enemies have casted lots for his garments, that's another prediction of what happens in uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And we could go on. 
But I think what, what the point of this is, is um, Jesus is pointing to these people to say, understand the broader storyline of Scripture. Understand Scripture from an immediate context, from a broader context, and from a complete context. And we'll get into that as we go forward in the coming chapters. But the goal of this class is to really help you to see that broader storyline of Scripture and to be able to communicate Scripture on those three different levels. And so the most important thing, I think, comes to what can I learn from this passage and apply it to my life? You know, facts are great, but application is important. And I hope that one thing we can learn from this passage is that that we need to look at scripture carefully we need to understand it correctly there is a better way to understand scripture there's a right way and a wrong way to understand scripture and it's important for us to keep in in an understanding of how this whole entire canon of the bible tells one unified story and that is a story that culminates uh thankfully in the life and work uh, of jesus christ and so thanks for listening to this lecture i look forward to sharing more lectures with you in the near future and uh um, I'm here to help if you need anything at all.